Okay, this is the third of uh, my series of lectures on operators in ergodic theory. And um, 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 uh, today I will talk about something completely different from what I did before. Uh, the topic of uh, today is the, uh, the so-called Jacobs de Leo Glicksberg splitting. This is Jacobs de Leo Glicksberg splitting. So after uh, Konrad Jacobs, uh, Karel de Leo and uh, Irving Glicksberg. And so Jacobs started this business in the uh, late 50s and then de Leo and Glicksberg uh, took this up and uh, published a series of papers. But uh, if you really look at this very closely, then you can find everything in Jacobs already. So maybe this is <laughs> somehow uh, Jacobs did the, uh, the main, uh, was the main breakthrough here. So what is it about? Um, it is, a, uh, so in modern, very fashionable terminologies about structure and randomness. So uh, it's always good to cite the master. So that's a citation of Terence Tao, of course. And uh, so there's a, uh, is a, a way of identifying the dichotomy of structure and randomness in a functional analytic way. Uh, so, um, <clears throat> So let me, let me be clear here, I don't claim that this is the universal gateway to these kind of dichotomy results. It's just one possible approach that works in certain situations. And actually, in, it works in ergodic theory, but, uh, but the, main, uh, the main applications here are actually a bit, uh, are much wider than, than just ergodic theory. So, uh, the, the, the functional analytic context is you have a Banach space and somehow you have dynamics, dynamic situation on the Banach space, operator dynamics on E, and uh, you want to uh, decompose it into two subspaces, and, uh, and this subspace uh, should have a very structured dynamics, so this is the structured, uh, uh, the structured component, and this, uh, this dynamics is, um, is quasi random, although um, I just take the terminology here over from Tau. What it means in functional analytic terms is that the asymptotically, some, some asymptotic property uh, means uh, asymptotics is zero here on that space. In, this, in, in, in whatever sense, we make this more precise. So I give the, I give the immediately the application in ergodic theory, that's the Kronecker factor. So um, the Kronecker factor is constructed as follows. Suppose you have a, a dynamic system, so X is a probability space, T is a Markov embedding on, on L1 of X. Uh, <clears throat> then you, uh, uh, you can define the following factor. Uh, you, take, you take an eigen, you take a, a complex number of uh, unit modulus, you take the eigenspace of the operator intersected with L infinity, you unify these, so you take all the L infinity eigenfunctions, these are all the L infinity eigenfunctions, and then you take the span and close it in the L1 topology. So this is a, um, this is a factor because uh, it's very easy to show that L infinity eigenfunctions, if you multiply two of them, will be a, L infinity eigenfunction again. So generalized eigenfunction can be also zero. So, so there. Um, okay. So this is um, this is the uh, this is a factor because this is an algebra. This is multiplicative set, and then if you take uh, if you uh, take the span and close it, then you get an then you get a factor. Obviously, it's t invariant. So that's a that's an important factor. And uh, so the splitting, of course, here the splitting is easy because we know that every factor is the range of, an, of the unique conditional expectation, Markov projection. So you have uh, the Kronecker factor 
And uh, here you have its orthogonal complement. Yeah, you can, yeah, yeah, yeah. So the, the whatever, they, uh, you take the orthogonal complement in L2 and then you close it in L1 or something like that. Yeah. So you can watch uh, these results purely in L2 terms, of course. Everything is coded already in L2. So here we have a, um, now, what is the asymptotic description here? Uh, so this is structured. Um, and uh, actually it says, so if the system is ergodic, then, then this is actually isomorphic to the rotation on a compact abelian group. That's the Halmos von Neumann theorem. I will not prove this here now. Uh, but this is, very, this, is this, this is very structured. Yes, it's a, rota it's a group rotation, essentially. And, uh, and here the asymptotic description can be obtained as follows. So a function is uh, orthogonal to the Kronecker factor if and only if, uh, let's say, for each g in L infinity, the function f tensor g is, uh, uh, is in the fixed space, is orthogonal, sorry. It's orthogonal to the fixed space uh, of uh, the, pro the, the product dynamics. And so from, so this, from this, you, uh, you easily get the, um, the usual common um, asymptotic, um, asymptotic characterization of, um, of being orthogonal to all eigenfunctions, that is, uh, this asymptotic uh, characterization. I think um, I, I do not tell more because I'm quite sure that Breiner will talk about this uh, just in, a, in an hour's time. Okay. Um, the, the main point is, okay, this is of course a very basic and very well-known, very important splitting in, into a structured and a random component in, in, in ergodic theory. Now, uh, uh, here's a different approach to this to this um, result, or to, to this splitting. And this is uh, based on this so-called jacobs dilly back splitting. I want to explain uh, uh, what that is. So uh, just forget this for a, for a while. Let's talk about compact semigroups. So I'm talking about a, a semigroup, S, Algebraically, just a, a, a set with a multiplication which, which is associative. Um, and then you have a compact topology uh, such that the semigroup is so called semi topological. That means the, uh, the semigroup multi uh, semi multiplication, the sem semigroup multiplication is not continuous as, as a mapping from, the, from, from S times S to S is not continuous, but it is separately continuous. So if, if you fix either component, then as a mapping from the other component is continuous. So this is, this is just multiplication. So that's a semi-topological, compact semi-topological semigroup. Now we call an, an, an idempotent, and uh, we know from Vitali's talk yesterday how important idempotents are. So idempotent, that means just that uh, if you square the element, you get it back. Uh, minimal, if it is contained in a, in a minimal left ideal. So just I write it and then I explain. If contained in minimal left ideal. So what is a left ideal? A left ideal is a set, a subset of S, and you, if you multiply it by any member of S, you don't leave the set. If you multiply it by, from left by, by any member of the set. That's an ideal. So, no, no, no. Uh, uh, a minimal left ideals in a compact semigroup are actually closed. So we don't, it's not important. So it's automa they are automatically closed. But um, so, uh, so I, 
I don't want to uh, unfold the whole theory here. I want just to uh, give you an impression what the central notions are and what is the central theorem. So, uh, so in the, if it's going to have a minimal left ideal and uh, e uh, so equivalently in a minimal right ideal. Uh, of course, minimal ideal means you just take the usual set ordering and, and, and you require it's minimal. Uh, actually, why such things exist is uh, that's, uh, due to compactness and there is a theorem of Ellis which says that, um, that actually every left ideal contains a minimal, uh, minimal left ideal and then also a minimal item potent. Every left ideal contains a minimal a minimal item potent. This is a, it's actually quite easy proof, it's just a compactness argument. Now let's call a, a semigroup admissible if, uh, if S actually contains not just a minim, one minimal, uh, not just minimal item potents, that's always true, but it contains a unique one. So if S contains Uh, unique minimal item potent. So it, is, it always contains minimal item potents. So the assertion here is that it is, there is only one. <clears throat> okay, one can ask, does, do such uh, situations exist? And uh, uh, here is uh, the standard situation, one of the standard situation, if S is abelian. And uh, let me give you the short proof uh, that, there, that there can only be one minimal item potent in an abelian semigroup, a compact left uh, semi-topological one. So suppose you have E and E prime minimal item potents. So then uh, you look at the following uh, left idea, you multiply E prime E from the left by the whole semigroup, so you get a left ideal, obviously. Uh, this left ideal is obviously uh, included in S times E, but since E is a minimal idempotent, this is a left, this is a minimal left ideal. Uh, and so this one, as being a left ideal included in a minimal one, they have to be equal. Now that's, this means if you, if you plug in here, if you take E here, so E times E can be represented as, a, an, uh, as, a, as an element S times E prime times E. So, so there is an element, let's say, small s and capital S, such that S E prime E is E times E, but that's the same as E. Now, uh, um, Multiply this from the right, or since we are a billion, doesn't matter, multiply this by E prime, then uh, here you get E times E prime, but here you get the same, because E prime swallows the, the additional E prime, because it's an item potent. So if uh, you get S E prime E prime, and then you interchange by a billionity, <laughs> And then e prime square is e prime again, so you get e e prime square e, which is the same as e prime e, which is e. So we prove that e e prime is e. Uh, now that you have uh, complete uh, symmetry here, you could have done this with e and e prime interchange, so you get uh, in the end you get e is e prime. Okay. So this is, this is one uh, important case. Um, another important case where this is always true, so somehow uh, uh, left topo semi-topological, compact semi-topological semigroups that are always admissible is if, if S is a, a, a minimal semigroup. I don't, I don't want to say more about this notion, just many of you have heard this in the context of, of groups. There's a corresponding theory of semigroups uh, when they are amenable, that goes back to day, uh, in the, also in the 50s, I guess. And uh, so this, if S is amenable, then also uh, S is automatically admissive. But for our purposes, abelian is actually um, sufficient.
Now, what is the uh, important theorem about these uh, kind of semigroups? This is the theorem of um, of Jacobs de Leo Glicksberg plus uh, uh, with help from Ellis, I would say. Uh, help means uh, not that Ellis cooperated, but uh, there's a theorem of Ellis going into this proof, an important uh, uh, result of Ellis, non-trivial result. So um, if S is an admissible semigroup, uh, and suppose uh, E is the unique minimal idempotent, then E times S is the same as S times E. <clears throat> this is not so, uh, okay, E times S is S times E. This is, uh, and this is a compact topological group. So first, topological group. So first of all, it is a group that means uh, okay, the idempotent E is the unit element in this group, obviously, because a group only has one idempotent, namely the unit element. And um, uh, so it's a, that's a group is, uh, is to say that, okay, with a semigroup structure, with this idempotent makes this set to a group. But then this group is compact, obviously, because S was compact and the shift by E is continuous, so it's also compact. Um, <clears throat> Um, but then, uh, then you have a, a group which is semi-topological and compact, and now the theorem of Ellis tells you that it's a topological group. That, 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 that means that here on this set, the, the semi-group multiplication is simultaneously continuous, continuous as a function, uh, this, let's say, g times g to g. So it's a topological group. So this is the non-trivial part, this uh, theorem of Ellis, which goes into this uh, proof. The other things are relatively elementary. So, uh, so why, what do we have from this? Okay, let's apply this. Let's apply this to, uh, uh, to our situation of Banner spaces and uh, uh, operators acting on that. So here, you have a Banner space and you have a semigroup of uh, operators on the Banner space. Semigroup just means that uh, if you, it's multiplicatively closed. So if you multiply two operators, you don't leave the set T. And you um, require that this is relatively compact uh, with respect to the weak operator topology or the strong operator topology d depending on which context you're working in. The, so that means the, the closure of the set in the weak operator topology, say, is a compact set. Um, the good thing is here you can test this on factors, on, uh, on individual orbits. So if, you, if you're not familiar with, uh, uh, so really what, what does it mean that a, a set is relatively compact in the weak operator topology, it just means that whenever you plug in elements and you take the orbit on that element, it is a relatively weakly compact set in the Banach space. The same with strong operator topology. So you can just test this on orbits and this is, how, or, or, this is how it is usually done. So it, if you have such a situation, and you know, in addition, that the semigroup, ah yeah, okay, now, now of course, the semigroup that you're considering is the closure of, uh, of the original semigroup. And this closure is um, in, in one of the operator topologies, the weak or the strong, uh, depending on which, which kind of uh, hypothesis you consider. Yes, and, uh, and now suppose that is admissible. So for example, if it is abelian, And uh, Q is the idempotent, the minimal idempotent, the unique one. So it's an operator whose square is itself, so it's a projection. It's a projection on the Banner space, so the, it decomposes the Banner space. <clears throat> uh, 
Now, on this Banger space here, the semigroup restricts to a compact, is, a, is, a, is actually a compact topological group representation on that Banach space. So here in that Banach space, the semigroup restricts to this, this one, but since uh, QS is the same as SQ, is, is the group, so the action of the semigroup is actually a group action. And not just a group action, it's, a group, it's an action of a compact group. So it's a, it's a, a, a group representation. You, you can apply the theory of group representation, so harmonic analysis to this, uh, to this situation. So we know that S acts on, on range Q as a compact topological group. And so you have harmonic analysis, and the harmonic analysis, for example, tells you that since this is also a, 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 a so it tells you that um, that somehow finite dimension or sub representation here generate everything. That's the Peter Weil theorem of uh, harmonic analysis. So somehow you find um, uh, you can decompose this space further into finite dimensional spaces, and on this you have. You have a topological group. Now, suppose further that, that uh, suppose you are, uh, this would be a Hilbert space and all these were contractions, then, then this would be a unitary representation on these, uh, uh, because it's. Yeah, but you can take this over. I mean, the, um, it, fo it follows from the Peter Weil theorem that this is for Banach representations too. Somehow, um, so if you're interested in the chapter 15 uh, <laughs> in, <laughs> in the book. So actually this, uh, this theorem of Banach representations of, uh, of, of let's say compact groups or is, um, you can carry over a lot from the, from the unitary representation of Hilbert spaces. This was done also by, there's a, there's a book by Liubich, Yuri Liubich, Yuri I hope, yeah. Uh, on this, sorry I have to. Let's have a look at time. Good. <clears throat> so that, that's, the, that's the structured part, so to speak. Compact group, is, you see the, the uh, allusion to the, to the Kornecker factor where you also have a compact ro group rotation. So coming, uh, <clears throat> saying more about this later. So this is the structured part. And what is the, um, what is the description of the, uh, uh, the orthogonal or the, the, the complementary part. So this can be described, this comes also out from the theory that zero is in the closure of the, um, of the orbit. And the closure here is to be taken uh, in, the, in the corresponding sense. I mean, if you work with weak operator topology here, you would have to have the weak closure. And if you work with strong operator topology, you would have to have the, uh, the strong closure. So this is an, uh, uh, <clears throat> so suppose, that, okay, no, maybe I shouldn't do, do too much at, at a time. So this turns out, in many cases, this turns out to be an asymptotic property. If, so here, of course, you just have a semi-group, you don't have a direction, you cannot speak about limits that in, for something t going to infinity, there is not, nothing such a thing. But now, uh, suppose that you would have a, a one single operator, and this is just the powers, then, then uh, the if being in the closure, zero being in the closure, uh, translates to, um, there's a, um, so it's, it's a cluster point of that sequence. And then uh, it is, it is a, um, a limit point of a subsequence, and if the semigroup is bounded, then whatever. Then you can, okay. Uh, it, it, this is really this is, this should really be what looked at as um, regarded as an asymptotic property. Okay, let me say some words about beyond abelian uh, semigroups. So I, I told you that abelian semigroups are always admissible, but uh, in some cases, even so, so non non-abelian, not even non-amenable semigroups uh, are admissible. And uh, <clears throat> here also Hilbert spaces save the day. So, 
So what can we say? Suppose E is a Hilbert space, and uh, uh, for every T in the semigroup, T is a contraction. So we call this a contraction semigroup. So uh, an operator with norm less or equal than one, it's called contraction. So this is a contraction semigroup. So the, uh, then T is, uh, is admissible for the weak operator topology. So it's relatively compact with respect to the weak operator topology. That's easy because on uh, the weakly compact sets are just the bounded sets because uh, e is a, e, uh, a Hilbert space is reflexive and, and, and that means just the unit ball is, uh, uh, is weakly compact. So that's, that's easy. The, 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 the interesting thing is why it's admissible. So why is it actually, does it have only one unique uh, idempotent? Here's a, here's a little proof. Suppose P and Q are the are minimal idempotents. I just erased, uh, no I didn't. Here's, here's, already, here's still the proof uh, for the abelian case. Um, so as, as here in the beginning, we get, this is just using minimality, so uh, we get this uh, also in the Hilbert space case. So there is an operator T in the, so of course S is the closure of uh, T, so there's an operator in the closure such that T uh, Q P is P. So this is just uh, this argument, and here we haven't used a billion, uh, uh, that it's abelian, we only used minimality. So that's the same. Now, but here, now comes the interesting thing in Hilbert space projections. So if you, if you plug in an element, you get the following. So this is a contraction, so, and um, um, this is also a contraction, so you get this again. So actually this is all, all the inequalities are equalities, in particular this is an inequality. Now, now this is an orthogonal projection because it's a contractive projection on the Hilbert space, it must be an orthogonal projection. Um, but, but you apply it to an element and it doesn't decrease the norm. So why is T closer to T is, everything are contractions. So everything is, why this here? Oh, because we just apply this argument. Yeah. We just apply this argument and then we find an operator such that this equality holds. And then we can uh, make this estimation, we get an equality here. And now this Q applied to Px doesn't, doesn't decrease the norm. So actually, it must leave this element invariant. So uh, because it's a Hilbert space geometry, so QP is actually P. Yes, and now you're done because then you do symmetry and uh, whatever. So it's uh, uh, then it's clear. <clears throat> so from the Hilbert space, uh, you, ex you extrapolate to, to the situation that we are usually having in ergodic theory, so Markov operators. I mean, these are contractions on, on the L2 space and then also on the L1 space. You can consider everything on L1. So from here also, so this is uh, one point. The other point is, let's say you have a T uh, a semigroup of Markov, uh, Markov operators on L1 of X and X of probability space. Yes, this is the other, uh, this is, this, this you can reduce to that Hilbert space case. And uh, if you use a bit more uh, subtle techniques, more or less the same, the same ideas here in an LP context, you can, you find that contraction semigroups on, on, on the reflexive LP spaces are always uh, weakly, uh, so admissible for the weak operator topology. But uh, we don't need this, so I, I leave this out. So this is pretty much the general uh, theory of, of this um, Jacobs de Leo Glicksberg splitting. Let us go back to the um, um, to the Kronecker factor. Um, okay, here, here it is. Okay, yes. so that's not so important. Let's look at this. So let's go back to Kronecker factor. Here you have a probability space 
and the Markov embedding, and then the, your group or your semi-group is just the powers of, uh, uh, of this one operator. And of course, the interesting compact semigroup is the, this is, these are all Markov operators contractions, so if you close it in the weak operator topology, um, you get a compact semi-topological semigroup on E is uh, L1 of X. Now Q is, let's say Q is the minimal item potent here. But then it's a Markov projection because these are all Markov operators and you have a, also Markov operators are weakly closed. So this is a Markov projection. So it is a conditional expectation. And if you, <clears throat> so if you apply this to the, uh, uh, the splitting, you get back just the, um, the Glicksberg, uh, you get back the Kronecker factor. So E is, uh, so it's range Q plus, kernel. if you restrict it to L2, then actually uh, uh, you have really, let's say, orthogonal projection, it's orthogonal complement, and, and here you can apply directly the unitary representation theory, so you know that this is, this is since this is an abelian uh, compact group, all the irreducible representations are one-dimensional, so it's eigenvalue, eigen, eigenfunctions, and, uh, and so this is uh, generated by the eigenfunctions, and this is the orthogonal complement, so get, you get back the uh, Kronecker factor here of x. And, uh, and as for the asymptotic characterization of the, of the orthogonal complement, I told you that an element here is characterized by this property. Now here, here you have a direction, and then it's uh, uh, some steps of uh, uh, some arguments to see that, uh, that this is actually uh, equivalent to the asymptotic uh, characterization I just uh, gave you in, in the beginning. Um, so, Here, something can be said because, um, of course, one can apply this to more general semigroup representations or group representations. So, uh, so if, um, because we are, we are mainly on Hilbert spaces here, so every uh, semigroup of Markov operators can be can be treated like this. So to each semigroup of Markov operators, you have the splitting and you get your minimal idempotent, which is a Markov projection. Um, and, um, um, and so Mackey, for example, he tried to generalize Holmos von Neumann theorem to general uh, rep Markov representations of locally compact groups. And uh, um, so he proved a theorem that is actually a corollary from this uh, general um, from this general theory of uh, Glicksberg, Dilu, and Jacobs. Okay, so you could say uh, in ergodic theory, so what can we do more in ergodic theory with this uh, splitting? Actually, I don't know. And that's it's a bit of a failure because uh, since a couple of years, we, this was the original idea that somehow one could bring in this kind of reasoning in, uh, in these higher uh, characteristic factors for the multiple ergodic averages, where Brian will talk about this in, 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 a, in just the next talk. And uh, uh, we failed. We, we have no clue since, so it's just, it seems that this is, uh, uh, that the Kronecker factor is, is the only reachable factor by this method, at least we couldn't do it until now. So we're still thinking about uh, kind of these kinds of uh, arguments somehow bringing in into um, uh, to construct other relevant factors for in ergodic theory, but somehow um, until now there is no success in this. So this is the negative message here. Uh, actually, I put a lot of we put a lot of work in there, but it was it is unsuccessful. Well, the positive message is that the splitting can be applied to other situations, non-ergodic theory situations as well. And, and here uh, it unfolds his real power, I would say. And uh, so in the last, um, let's say 10 minutes, I want to, want to show you a, another application of this splitting 
uh, also relevant in, uh, in, in stochastics, for stochastics, um, but not an ergodic theory uh, situation. And, <clears throat> okay, I, I restrict here to, um, to the most basic, uh, basic case so that everything can be explained in this talk. Uh, other things would, well, to, more, to go to more general situations, it would require more work. Um, I skip. But, so this is the lasota yorke uh, theorem. And uh, uh, here's the setting. So you suppose we, now we take a, a sigma a finite measure space. But actually, that's also not really important. So. Um, and um, suppose you have a, a, a dynamics which is, not, um, which is not measure preserving anymore, but which pre just preserves null sets. So that's called a non-singular transformation. And uh, uh, we also could call it regular, but somehow they like to non before it works, I don't know. So it's a non-singular. That means, that means it, it respects null sets. So uh, it's measurable, of course, and then uh, the inverse of a null set is a null set. Uh, no, 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 not at all, not at all. And, uh, <clears throat> and of course, then you have a Koopman operator on L infinity of the, of the measure space because it respects null set. And now, uh, by the Radon-Nikodim theorem, uh, you prove that, that it actually has a pre-adjoint on L1. So uh, there is an operator P on L1, such that the adjoint of P is the Koopman operator. And this P is called the Perron-Frobenius operator. So that's the Perron Frobenius operator. The, 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 um, since this leaves one function constant, the Perron Frobenius uh, operator, as, an, as the adjoint or pre adjoint, leaves the integral invariant. So, so P is a positive operator in the sense that it maps positive functions to positive functions and it preserves the integral. So, uh, unfortunately, in their theory, these are called Markov operators, too. So, these are Markov operators on L1, with, if you have such properties. So, it's Markov operators on L1. As I, saw, as I said already, Markov is overused. Markov uh, operators on L1. So, these are the, this is the class now. And the, the decisive thing is that okay, you don't have a necessarily a probability space anymore, and it doesn't. Um, so it it, it it doesn't have necessarily um, uh, a positive element which is fixed. But otherwise, if you have a fixed element here, you can somehow replay everything back to the probability space situation and to the uh, what we called Markov operators in the in the first two talks. Okay, <clears throat> now uh, here you can ask questions about uh, invariant density. Okay, what density, uh, the densities are those functions uh, with integral one. These are the densities. And you can ask for invariant, uh, invariant densities, but you can also ask for stability. So uh, what happens if you iterate this operator? Um, uh, will, it, uh, will it converge to, to something? And um, <clears throat> so there, there were papers in the, in the 80s. Uh, uh, I'm not sure about, because I didn't look at your paper, <laughs> but uh, you also contributed to that uh, discussion, at least Lasota, York, cite you in, uh, uh, in, in their papers. So there are Lasota, York, and then uh, Komornik in the, no, 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 Andrzej, a Polish mathematician. Um, I also was uh, actually th thinking about th whether this is this guy, but then I found out it's not. Komornik uh, in the 1980s, so, so around mid-1980s, starting from the mid-1980s. 
Um, they uh, considered conditions under which uh, you have, so this, this operator P is, uh, is um, quasi almost periodic, so it's almost periodic, has almost periodicity properties. And if you hear almost periodicity, you should always think of the Jacobs de Leo Glicksberg splitting, it's because it's the same. So, so what were the conditions? So they had a condition, and I, I give it the simplest case. In the, it, it was generalized uh, in many steps, but so the simplest condition that they consider is uh, there is a compact set. Uh, there is a compact set such that um, uh, for every f in the density. Uh, just the usual strong topology of LX, the norm topology on LX. Yeah, but of course the generalizations go to weak, weakly compact sets too. But I'm, st I'm staying now here in the easiest case. So this is where they started really with a compact uh, set. So such that for every density the distance of F of uh, PNF to C converges to zero. So somehow it's an attractor, you could say. It, it, this compact set attracts the, uh, all the densities. And um, so this, this is what they call a constrictive operator. And then later on it was, uh, this was replaced by uh, weaker conditions, also weakly compact sets and so on, quasi-constrictive operators. But let's stick here. So, uh, now I want to apply just to show that Vicksberg de Leo theory yields this Lasso de York theorem just by in a couple of steps. So uh, first of all, from this condition you can imagine that the orbits of each of each density is is uh, relatively weakly compact because uh, somehow uh, you want to have it um, pre-compact pre and. Uh, Somehow uh, this is already compact, and this is within a, within arbitrary distance to to this compact set. So, this, so the orbits are pre-compact. That means that our semigroup is uh, relatively compact with respect to the strong uh, operator topology. That's uh, just coming out from the from this condition here. So one can apply that it's a a billion, so one can apply Glicksberg de Leo theory and get the splitting for the strong operator topology. So, Glicksberg, Jacobs, Glicksberg de Leo, Jacobs de Leo, Glicksberg, this is the, maybe the right order, yields a, um, a projection Q, minimal, this is the minimal idempotent and the corresponding closure of the semi group and the splitting. Now this is a this Q has has the same properties as P. It preserves the integral and it's positive. Then it follows that this this space here is actually a sublattice of L1. So since Q is positive and preserves the integral, uh, it follows that the range of Q is a sublattice. Now, sublattice here is it's a bit weaker than what we did before in the probability space case because there also the one function was fixed. And um, so we don't have a one function here in that in L1 of x. Um, but a general theorem of uh, Banach lattice theory tells you that this is actually isomorphic to another L1 space. That's the so called uh, IL representation space by Kakutani. You don't, not, you don't need, not necessarily need this here just for information that, that this range of Q has again this form as a, as a one space. Now, think of this. This is a compact group. Uh, okay, so um, <clears throat> the, um, uh, what do I want to say? So the, uh, the QF is, uh, is, is uh, maps is an asymptotic property. So QF maps actually into C for every density. So what it what it uh, means is that on this space the unit ball, the unit ball is compact. 
So you can, from, from, this, um, uh, from this condition here, you follows, it follows that the unit ball of uh, range Q is compact. But it's a Banner space, and it has a, unit, a compact unit ball, so it's finite dimensional. Now, it's a finite dimensional L1 space that must be atomic with finitely many atoms. So actually, L1 of Y is just R, of R to the power D. So this uh, range Q is just, uh, it's just this. And the, the semigroup acts as a group on this space as a positive group, that means as lattice homomorphisms, because the, 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 the operators are positive and the inverses are also positive, so they are, so uh, absolute values are preserved. But that means it must map atoms to atoms, so it's just, um, uh, it's just a permutation on that, on that space. It, has, it, it, is a, it is a group of, of uh, lattice homomorphisms on this space, so it maps atoms to atoms, so it's a, it's a permutation. So, so P on, uh, on this space is just a permutation okay and now and now the other th this is the, the structured part how, how, more, how more structure can you get than if you just permute certain atoms and um, and um, uh, here I said, okay. Here, these are the elements where x is is this the is just the strong in the strong closure zero is in the strong closure of the orbit. But then, because all these operators are contractive, it just means that p and x goes to zero on that on that. Uh, and that okay. Here's a little argument. Uh, so these f's such that p and f goes to zero. So you have. Uh, you have strong convergence to, um, uh, to a permutation on, on an atomic finite dimensional uh, Banach lattice. And this is, this is the lasota yorck theorem. So it is a, the lasota yorck theorem uh, is just this. That, uh, and of course, uh, under more, under more uh, uh, conditions, for example, if the, se if the semigroup is irreducible, then, uh, then, then this permutation, of course, must be a whole cycle. And um, now think of the, uh, um, a continuous version of this, not just one single operator, but let's say you have a semigroup, a strongly continuous semigroup of this, then, uh, and, you, and it is irreducible, then you would have a, a, a full cycle well, not, not even, I mean, uh, yeah, you have a full cycle uh, and it's an irreducible semigroup. So, um, okay, it's a, as, a, as a semigroup, it uh, is continuous, has continuous orbits, but this is, uh, the, the set of atoms here is discrete, so it must fix every, uh, every atom, and since it's irreducible, it, uh, it must have only one atom. So you get, you, you see in the a, in a, in a strongly continuous uh, analog here, under the irreducibility assumptions, you could guarantee that D is one, and you have a one-dimensional fixed space, and so you have one, uh, uh, so you have, pro you have uh, actually strong, strong uh, um, convergence to, uh, to a one-dimensional projection, and that is, um, Okay, this is the, uh, the, the, the nicest asymptotic behavior you can think of for such a situation. Okay, I hope I demonstrated a bit the power of this uh, Jakobs de Liu Glicksberg theory. If you, um, if, you, if you hear something about asymptotic periodicity, something like this, you um, think of Jakobs de Liu Glicksberg, it's in the back. Okay, thank you very much. <laughs>